Your hosts have earned a reputation as fierce and effective advocates inside and outside of the courtroom. Both partners are experienced trial attorneys who have been board certified in family law by the Texas Board of Legal Specialization. All right, uh, welcome back to For Better, Worse, or Divorce. I'm Brian Walters. I'm here with Jake Gilbreth. We will be continuing our mental health and addiction and litigation series. In this episode, we'll discuss alcoholism and how that uh, can affect a divorce or a child custody case. All right, well, Jake, I mean, here we go with alcohol, right? It's now legal. It wasn't for a little while in this country, but it's legal. Um, it's widely used, um, not, not as widely abused, but it is abused. Um, and so it raises its head and um, in divorces and child custody cases. I guess I should say on the side, I've occasionally had it raise its financial head in the sense that it's uh, had a couple of cases where the one spouse was spending so much money on alcohol that it was uh, really affecting the, the budget um, for the parties. And, and uh, But generally what it relates to is children, right? Because if you don't like the way your spouse drinks or your boyfriend or girlfriend or your baby mama, or baby daddy, they don't you don't like how they're drinking alcohol, then you know, when you go your separate ways, you're not to deal with it anymore, right? Unless you have children. And then it can become a problem. Um, and that ranges anywhere from somebody who you know, drinks a glass of wine and the, the other spouse is, uh, doesn't drink any alcohol and just thinks alcohol is just not, never okay to the extreme where you have two completely uh, drunk or alcoholic parents. That, that actually happens to the uh, probably the most common one that we see where we have one person that's sober and one person that's not. And, um, and then there's concerns when they split up because let's say the, the, the alcoholic parent was drinking, drinking, drinking and passed out at 8.30 every night after, you know, a six vodka and tonics and um, doesn't wake up till the next morning and they got three kids under the age of eight and the other parent's been, okay, well, they're passed out. I'm going to take care of them tonight. And, and, uh, and then everything's back to normal in the mornings to some extent. But now they're going to be split up. So the parent who's been sober and taking care of the young kids in the middle of the night, um, you know, let's say someone like that comes to you, they're divorcing. What are you going to probably hear and how, what are you going to advise them or, or what options are you going to give them? Yeah. So somebody comes in and, you know, we have both sides, right? Sometimes people come in and the other spouse, you know, they're, they're, they're the sober parent or the one that doesn't struggle with alcohol. And then, you know, when you have somebody on the other side, uh, or you, you may have the parent that, that, you know, does struggle or at least is face, facing the accusation. And it's kind of like we talked about with the um, substance abuse uh, podcast. It's, it's a range, right? I mean, it's, it, it, it's really important, I think, in the initial consult on both sides to really drill down kind of what actually is going down on. You know, if you stop the conversation when somebody comes in and says, my spouse is an alcoholic, and you don't really drill down to what that means, um, you know, you you're going to be doing a really disservice to the client because it's people have different definitions, right? I have some, it's like you were saying, Brian, I have some people come in and say, my spouse has a huge problem with alcohol. And then you kind of talk to them. It's like, well, it turns out that they have one Bud Light a, a night, right? With dinner. And the, the spouse doesn't like that. I'm not saying they should like it or not, but you know, does that raise the definition of an alcoholic? Certainly not in court. And then, you know, some people, they come in and they're married to the alcoholic. In my experience, um, is, you know, when you're married to the alcoholic, sometimes you lose some, I don't say you lose touch with reality. It's almost, you, you, you're so in it and life becomes so bizarre when you're married to the alcoholic or you're, you know, have a family member that's, a, that's an alcoholic. You sometimes don't realize how bad it is. So you'll have clients that'll come in and say, you know, I've got some concerns with my, my spouse's alcohol consumption. And you start talking to them. It turns out he's on his third DWI drinks, you know, 10 beers a night. There's pictures of hidden alcohol and, you know, people passed out with kids around and stuff like that. And so every single case, I mean, people come to us with their definitions, but it's important to sort of drill down about what actually is going on. And then so once it becomes an issue, you see that alcohol is an issue. It's, uh, the big question is, you know, how do you prove it in court? Either way, right? You know, how do you, how do you prove if it is a problem? And you're trying to say it's a problem. And if somebody's accusing you of being a problem, how do you prove it's not a problem? You know, how do you go in there and prove the negative uh, in court? So 
I guess pick one of those two, Brian. What do you what do you do in court? Yeah, I mean, um, th these are problems. Uh, they really are. I mean, the prove the negative one is kind of um, <laughs> to me that's the that's the tricky one, right? Because it, the common situation that we hear is, well, you know, sure I drink, but so does my spouse, and um, you know, it's not a big deal either way, right? And so. How do you prove that? Um, that that can be a problem. Um, do you have a preferred way of dealing with it, or? It's. It I guess it goes back to drilling down. If I really think, you know, and you got to know your judges too. Some judges they hear alcohol and they just say, okay, well, nobody drinks, right? Nobody drinks while this case is pending. If I've got any concerns, I'm going to test you. Um, and you know, you have to let the client know that, right? You're, I understand you don't think there's a problem. This judge is going to say no drinking, so let's just take it off the table and just do no drinking. Um, and not every single judge is like that, though, right? I mean, if you've got the the false accusation, uh, so let's start with that, right? Let's say you, your client is being accused of drinking too much, um, and, and that it's not the case. It's either being made up or somebody's maybe taking advantage of it for litigation or, or exaggerating. It's case by case, right? If I think that there's something to it, then I may tell the clients, like, well, why don't we just go ahead and say we're not going to drink when we have the child? We don't think it's a problem but we're not going to drink when we have the child. If I think it's you know more of a problem for the client, I may even have them voluntarily do some type of testing, right? Just to tell a judge, we don't think it's an issue, but it's always been talked about in the, in the marriage. There's an issue in our marriage. We're just, judge, we're going to be proactive about this. Um, some situations it is so clearly, you know, made up or exaggerated. You just have somebody come in and just, just, you know, with testimony, they have some supporting witnesses, Let's say that, that that it's not a problem. So that's when you have the client that you know is being accused of it. And of course, on the other extreme, you have clients and people come to us, and we want them coming to us that, that really do struggle with alcohol. And a lot of them come to us where they're at that point where they've realized uh, that that they're having uh, that their alcoholism is causing issues in their in their marriage and their lives. I mean, what is it's like my life's become unmanageable, right? I'm powerless over alcohol, and my life's become unmanageable. A lot of times that leads to a divorce, right? If your life is unmanageable, that can lead to a divorce. And so you have the client that coming in that, that you know, recognizes that there's an issue. Uh, you know, first thing I always do is try to encourage them, right? It's not the end of the world. It's it's a disease. Um, and it's a disease that, that you know, we can address. And we can address, obviously, in your personal life. But through the, through the custody case and the divorce, we're usually talking about a commitment to not drink. Um, for, especially when you have your kids, sometimes people commit to not drink, period. And if they really are sort of committed uh, to moving forward, we're talking about testing and making sure that we can prove sobriety, getting people hooked up with good sponsors and AA programs and all that stuff is, um, you know, it should be a discussion that that we have with all of our clients. Um, you know, then you have the flip side, right? You have the person coming in that they're they either they're sober, they don't struggle with drinking, their spouse is uh, struggling with alcohol. And so talk about proving that, Brian, I guess what's that's, that's also hard, right? It's not like a drug. It's not like somebody does heroin, just go take a hair test. And oh, look, there's heroin. <laughs> and that's into the discussion on that alcohol. There's not I mean, there's tests, but there's not really a magic test of, you know, blow into this and we can now see how much you've been drinking the last six months. Right. I mean, it's, you know, any testing that exists for alcohol is really at the moment. I mean, uh, alcohol stays in your blood for such a short period of time that it's, you know, it doesn't tell you much about other than what, what's happened the past four to six hours, probably, if, you, if even that. So um, that is really tricky. And, um, and so the best we can really do is, uh, you know, a testing regime. Uh, there's a couple different ways to do it that, that test you on a regular basis each day and maybe even even at a, either either at a set time um, or at a random times. And uh, so you never really know when it's when it's going to hit you. And uh, so the most common one is to do it three times a day, kind of right when you you know wake up in the morning, um, you know, mid afternoon and, and before you go to bed and um to see if there's any alcohol whatsoever. And, and there's a way around that, right? If you know, I'm gonna get tested at 8 a.m., you know, 4 p.m. and midnight or whatever, uh, then you, you know, if you get tested at midnight, you know, you're not gonna be tested till late in the morning, you can crack open the bottle, bottle of vodka at 12.01 and 
you know, as long as it's within reason, you can probably, uh, you know, have a, have a, a good time there for a few hours and uh, drink a lot of water and then go to sleep. Yeah. Now you the random that, ones are a little catch, trickier. Right? Uh, that's the catch. It's within right. reason. Like I think a lot of them, you know, I've had situations on both sides, right? But it's the try to beat the test, try to beat the test, try to try to drink in those windows. But you know, it's it's a horrible disease, right? And so you may tell you tell yourself, I'm going to have three vodka tonics, and then that way it'll be out of my system by the time I test at 8 a.m. And, you know, now it's four vodka tonics and five, and I think I can have just one more. And then, you know, that 8 a.m. test, I can't tell you in my career how many times I've seen positive tests at 8 a.m. blows. And not because I think people are having vodka for breakfast, although I've had that too, uh, but uh, because they drank so much the night before, they try to get drinking in between the last test and the first test next morning that they're, you know, still blowing, you know, 0.07s or something in the morning where they haven't had a drop of alcohol for the last five hours. Right. And um, so, yeah, these, these are, I mean, the other option is the, the, uh, the random ones that they, you, know, you get a text and you get a blow into it within 15 minutes. And that, that might be more of a deterrent because um, you never know when it's going to happen. But, but if you really have that overwhelming urge to drink, you can probably talk yourself into it. Oh, I'm probably, it's probably not going to happen. Right. Having, I just, you know, just got one. It's probably not going to happen again. There are tests of antibodies now that you can have in your blood system to see um, the, basically the antibodies that break down uh, alcohol. And uh, the more you drink, the more, um, the more of those antibodies are going to be in your system. The problem is, is that doesn't tell us what's happened recently, right? So that, that will tell us your overall drinking history over, let's say the past a month or so, but well, it'll, it'll tell us whether you've been drinking significant amounts of alcohol or not. But if your argument is, you know, I quit two weeks ago and you run that test on somebody, then they're going to still have antibodies and you really don't know if, if they had a drink yesterday or they had a drink three weeks ago. So um, it's better for monitoring kind of long-term somebody who needs to stay sober for a long period of time rather than kind of getting a snapshot of what's actually happened. Because that's, that's often what we get, right? I think we mentioned it, right? Oh, well, yeah, I had a little bit of a drinking problem. She's exaggerating it, but I've stopped, right? And I'm not going to drink again. And sometimes you need to, as a judge, you need to make a decision on whether that's true or not and whether they're capable of stopping or not. Well, and, and back to proving in court, I mean, it is that extreme, right? Sometimes you have cases where it's just testimony, right? It's one spouse coming in, one it's he said versus she said, and that's not uncommon, right? And then you have the other extreme where you've got, DWIs and DWIs with kids in the car, DWIs, and you've got, you know, pictures of people passed out drunk or, you know, hidden alcohol or, you know, multiple relapses and, and rehab stays and stuff like that. It's just, it really is a case by case scenario. Um, I, and I think our judges a lot, even more so than testing and, um, and that sort of thing. I think they're really looking at behavior, right? I mean, it's just, uh, I think a lot of them try really hard to try to understand this stuff. And I think they can tell a lot just by how somebody behaves, right? You really can tell, uh, at least my experience, right? I'm not a mental health professional, but you can tell if somebody's committed to, to their sobriety. You can tell if somebody's, you know, having, is struggling with alcohol. And, and, you know, the best thing is whenever you have the client that comes to you and that they, um, you know, they have an issue and they're working it and you start seeing the difference, right? When somebody, commits to sobriety, you know, the next time you see them, they're, they're looking better. The next time you see them, you know, they're clearing up, losing weight, you know, doing better, working with their sponsor. Uh, and because ultimately at the end of the day, it's, you know, we're, we're here, we, we serve a limited role, right? Like we're helping people get through a divorce, but you know, it's like, I want you improving in your life. I mean, that's the whole point, right? So we're supposed to help you get through this, uh, this situation and be there for you. And, you know, some, that's for good times and, and bad times. Um, and, you know, I've had people, I've had clients that struggled with, with alcoholism through their divorce and you, you know, and start going to treatment and commitment to their sponsor. You talk to them in a few years, they're working their program still, talking to their sponsor. I've had clients that went out and worked in the um, addiction arena because uh, once they got, uh, once they got sober and it's, it's really, I think that's really rewarding. Like that's one of the most rewarding things that we do. And, you know, we're kind of there for the process of people, um, you know, really kind of turning their lives around. And then of course it's really rewarding when you represent the protective parent, right. Um, and that you're able to go in there and put in 
um, put in safeguards, you know, for the kids. And, and then it's really great whenever you're able to go in there and put in the safeguards and you see the change in the other side, right? You represent the protective parent and, you know, sometimes the court intervention is that wake up call and the other side gets sober or, or, you know, gets on the path of sobriety and it really makes a difference in people's lives and in kids' lives. As cheesy as it sounds, right? It's like we change people's lives or we're there for the change in their life and we're, we get to be part of that. It's, um, it's really rewarding. Hard cases, but they're, it can be really rewarding. Yeah, for sure. And I think there's you know one more thing to talk about and we can wrap up, which is that you know, we've talked about kind of straight line cases, right? Like somebody's a bad alcoholic and, you know, and then the other person just gets sober and there's a happy ending. I mean, that's, you know, life is a little more complicated than that for most, most people struggling with, with alcoholism. It's, you know, maybe they have six months of sobriety and then they, you know, have a couple drinks one night. Maybe the, maybe the kids aren't there. Um, they pop up positive on a, on a test. Um, what do we do? Right. You, well, you're supposed to say sober. You didn't, um, you didn't, you know, you didn't tell anybody you had to get caught with a, with a test. Um, do we, you know, if you, if you've got kind of a stair step up to normal visitation by that point, do we yank you back down to the bottom or do we just tell you to go back two steps? I mean, those are sometimes those are the hardest of the, of all the cases. And, um, and there's not an easy answer. I think it's very, it's like you said, it's very specific. You know, you got to figure out what exactly happened, what's likely to occur again, um, how bad the relapse was. Was it a, you know, week long bender or was it just a, you know, had a couple of beers and watching a game or something like that. So those, those are tricky. Um, you got to deal with all of them. And um, tra- if you're going to try to be sober as, you know, as the experts will tell you, it's a, it's a daily struggle. And, um, so not easy. Well, it's progress, not perfection. And, and one of the unfortunate things about the court system is sometimes we insist on perfection and that can be, um, you know, it's this balance, right? It's, it's, and, and that those are the, the hard cases too, right? You have somebody that's, you know, rigorous honesty, you want to be open, you want to talk about what's going on, but on the flip side, you know, that it could have a negative impact on your case. Um, you know, it's the same thing as preparing for court. It's hard. It's like, do I go in there and tell the judge, yeah, I'm struggling with alcohol, um, but then I know that that's going to impact my custody case, or do I go in there and try to minimize it, but then, you know, if the judge gets the sense that I'm minimizing it, uh, then, you know, that's the uh, that, that's obviously not bad as well. I mean, it's it's a little crass. I don't know if it's a crass way of describing it, but but I'll say it. I mean, it's I tell clients this all the time, and I say it as a frustration with the legal system, right? It's like, I tell people, you get somebody up there on the witness stand and they testify about their alcohol use and they say, well, I don't think I have a problem with alcohol. Then everybody goes, ah, they're, this person's in denial, right? So they, they're they hopeless. They're in denial. But then if you get up there and you go, ah, I'm really struggling with alcohol um, and I'm working on it, everybody goes, oh, my God, it's so bad. Even she admits it, right? It's and you kind of it's it's a hard balancing act of like, you know, if we're not in a divorce, not a custody situation. You would be, you know, you work the problem probably differently than if you're in a custody situation. I, I think that's for the, for our clients that have addiction issues and they're kind of struggling to. You're, it's. I think it's almost a harder road for them because you know you're doing it with the court system um, looking over you. You've got a nervous parent on the other side, which is understandable, but looking for mistakes and you know it's. I think it just makes recovery that much harder. But, but, you know, again, I see people do it, right? And it's great to be there for them. And when it's when there is a relapse or there's a there's an issue that comes up, we're there for the clients too. I mean, we're not those lawyers that, you know, oh, you messed up, see you later. We don't want to be here anymore. Um, you know, we're here for the, for the good and bad um, and see it all the way through. Yeah, I agree with that. It's certainly a, an important topic and a really common one for, for better or worse. All right. That's all we have for today. If you like what you've heard, please do us a favor and leave us a review. We appreciate all your feedback. It helps us make this a better podcast. This concludes our mental health and addiction series. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us however you like, including uh, by email at podcast at waltersgilbreth.com. I'm Brian Walters, and this is Jake Gilbreth. Thanks again for listening. For information about the topics covered in today's episode and more, you can visit our website at waltersgilbreth.com. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode of For Better, Worse, or Divorce, where we post new episodes every first and third Wednesday. Do you have a topic you want discussed or a question for our hosts? Email us at podcast at waltersgilbreth.com. 
Thanks for listening. Until next time.